Welcome to Episode 5 in our Radio Design 101 series. Today we're going to talk about radio frequency mixers. Now if you haven't seen the previous episodes, don't worry, this one doesn't significantly depend on the previous ones. We're going to talk about mixer theory, but we're also going to illustrate what we're discussing with some experimental results, as you can see here. Now if you've seen some of our previous episodes, you know that this material is supporting a senior level design course. But this material is not necessarily focused on that course. This is very general material and I'm going to try to cover most of the mixers and receiver architectures used in modern radios. And we'll do that by looking at these specific topics. We're going to start off with an overview and we're going to talk about applications. This is actually broken down into two parts because there's a lot of material here. Um, in part two, we'll cover these additional three topics. A math review, some circuit designs, and then finally we'll get back to the FM receiver project. So let's get right to it. To understand the importance of mixers, let's take a real quick look at early radios that did not use them. This is a circuit diagram that's been discussed in some previous videos. But the important thing here is to note that there are LC filters here, and there are amplifying stages, these first two tubes. The last one is the so-called detector or demodulator. Back in 1912 or thereabouts, whenever this was done, these worked, but only at low frequencies. The problems are shown over here on the right. What was found was that achieving high gain to get good sensitivity became difficult at high frequencies. Not because you couldn't get enough gain in each of these stages. You can always cascade a bunch of stages together. But when you do that at high frequency, a highly amplified signal at the output can actually couple back to the input or to the antenna and the thing turns into an oscillator. And that's not a receiver, although they did make use of that in some regenerative receivers. But it was certainly not ideal. Another problem, a related problem, is that the filter quality factor, the sharpness of the filter, became difficult to get at very high frequencies. And finally, in order to get any selectivity at all, we needed several filters, and you had to retune those every time you changed the channel. So this is where mixers come in. Back around 1917, I think, uh, they figured out that if two signals multiplied each other together, then they would produce new frequencies. And you can see that here in this diagram. We've got an RF signal at a high frequency and an LO signal down here at a slightly lower frequency. And if you multiply those together, this is the symbol for a mixer, and that means multiply, because as we'll see, that's how mixers work. What happens is you get out a waveform that may look like this. And you can see, obviously, a lower frequency component here. In addition to that, you get out a higher frequency, and that's noted down here. But in the early days, and in many modern radio designs, as we'll see, we're interested in the lower frequency output. The advantages of this design over the tuned RF design that we looked at a second ago is that amplification is now done at two different frequencies. So there's some amplification done at RF, at the incoming frequency, but then most of it will be done at a lower frequency. Equally importantly, if you want to change the channel, then what you do is you simply change the frequency of this thing called the LO, or the local oscillator. That's because there's what's called an intermediate frequency filter here. It tends to be a fairly narrow bandpass filter, and it will only let through a certain frequency at its input. So only a specific RF frequency that got mixed with the LO here will produce a frequency that gets through and then gets amplified and demodulated and used. If you want to change to a different RF frequency, you simply tune the LO to a different frequency. And we're going to illustrate this in a minute. Finally, this method, called the superheterodyne receiver design, gives you much better selectivity. And that's because this IF frequency filter here is much easier to design and you don't have to retune it every time you change stations. And this mixer concept is used 
in virtually all modern high-frequency radio designs and test equipment, as we'll see, including superheterodyne receivers like this one, something called direct conversion receivers like used in cell phones. We'll take a look at those. Up-down conversion design. So not only do you sometimes convert from a high frequency to a lower frequency, sometimes you convert from a high frequency to an even higher frequency. And we're going to see how that's used in spectrum analyzers. And transmitters and frequency synthesizers and more. Now, that's a ton of material, and we can't cover all of that here. So we're not going to show a whole lot of transmitter material, but maybe we'll touch on some. So here's our first demo. Let me talk you through what we have set up. We have a mixer, which you can see here on the left, but you can also see in the center. And we'll talk about how this mixer is made. I'll show you the schematic and talk about this circuit board design. Supplying the mixer are two inputs, as seen in the block diagram here, one from the RF and one from the local oscillator. Here, I'm using a analog signal generator to serve as the local oscillator. And that was because it's one of the purest sources that I have. The RF is going to come from the Nano VNA. And we have a previous video where we talk about using the Nano VNA as a synthesized signal generator. You're going to use it partly because of that, but also partly because it will sweep in frequency. And I can make that sweep over a fairly narrow range, and that'll sort of look like an FM signal. The output of the Nano VNA goes through a 30 dB attenuator. That's because it's about 0 or plus 2 dBm here, and we need it smaller when it goes into the mixer. Finally, the IF output is hooked to one of these tiny SA spectrum analyzers. And you can see the result over here on the right-hand side. I have the tiny SA set to sweep between 0 Hz and 200 MHz. So each one of these divisions is 20 MHz. And there's a lot of stuff on this screen, so let's take it a piece at a time. Marker 1 is set here at 70 MHz. Remember, each division is 20 MHz, so this is 20, 40, 60, 70 MHz. Plus, it reads it out at the top. Don't get too concerned about the exact numbers up here, because these spectrum analyzers are not that accurate when you're on a wide span. The point to be made here is that this is the 70 MHz signal. That's what I had the LO input set to. And we're seeing this at the IF output because, like all mixers, they're not perfect. So not only do you get out the sum and the difference frequencies, as we're going to talk about, but you also see some of the signals that went in. And so this is what's called the LO feed-through. Also, the other input to the mixer was the RF, and you can see the RF feed-through. And that's nominally at 90 megahertz, but notice that it has some width to it in the yellow. So the yellow is a peak hold mode in the spectrum analyzer. The red is kind of an instantaneous look. The reason I did that is so that we can more easily understand which of these is the RF signal and which is the LO. The LO is constant. The RF signal is frequency modulated, plus and minus 2.5 megahertz. And that's shown here in the block diagram. Now, note that with the RF at 90 megahertz and the LO at 70, we expect to get out the difference of those two, or 20 megahertz. And if you look at the lower right-hand corner, you can see that we do, in fact, get out 20 megahertz. Not only that, but what comes out is just a frequency-shifted version of the RF signal that went in, including all its modulation. So the plus and minus 2.5 megahertz sweep, or FM, is showing up at the output frequency at 20 megahertz. Now, as noted, you get out the difference frequency, but you'll also get out the sum frequency, which in this case is 160 megahertz. And we can see that down here in the lower right. But the main point is that the RF signal here at 90 megahertz has been shifted down to 20. Now let's take a look at this hardware that we're using to do the frequency conversion. This is built around a classic integrated circuit called the NE602 or SA602. It depends on when it was made and the manufacturer. So here we have a picture of the top of the board, but also a picture of the back side of the board. Now, there's a lot here. And as I mentioned in previous videos, I don't want to spend too much time on any single slide. So my advice is, 
if you really want to digest something well, freeze the video and study it. But let's walk through this piece right here first. So here's what it looks like from the top. This is a nice little proto board in the sense that you can put components in it and you can solder surface mount components on it. And like any good prototyping board, it can be used to build virtually any circuit. Except this particular board is built for RF. The back side has a ground plane. You can see the leads of the integrated circuit coming through the board here, and those are soldered to pads which are not touching the ground plane. But sometimes we want some pads to touch the ground plane, like this particular one over here. This is actually pin 3 of the IC. And you have to bridge between the center circle here and the ground plane, and it's kind of a hard thing to do. So uh, it's kind of messy. Sorry about that. Back on the top side, we soldered a U.FL connector with a ground soldered here and the center lead of the connector going to this pad, which then has a surface mount capacitor on it that goes to this pad. And then to get over to pin 2 of the chip, I just put a small wire and carefully soldered that. Similarly, on the right-hand side, the LO comes in on a UFL connector, goes through a capacitor for a DC block, and then goes over to pin 6 of the chip. This is a zero ohm resistor. It's just an alternative to using a piece of wire to try to bridge these pads. It's very hard to bridge them just like on the back side with solder because surface tension tends to make the solder just stick to one pad or the other and not bridge. So sometimes we use zero ohm resistors for that. And this is the IF output down here at the bottom. So again, here's the schematic. You can look up the data sheet if you're interested in this, but I'm going to kind of leave it here. So pause the video if you're interested in studying these notes further because you maybe want to build something like this. But let's move on. So here's some spectrum outputs taken with different LO settings. Previously we had an LO of 70 megahertz and an RF of 90 megahertz and we got out 20. Here I've moved the LO up to 80 megahertz, left the RF at 90, and it converts it down to 10. And of course if I vary this 80 a little bit right or left, the frequency that it gets converted down to will vary as well. And of course, in a receiver that has a 10.7 megahertz filter, like in our project, uh, we might want to move this from 80 down to, say, 79.3, and that would create a difference of 10.7, and that would move this up to 10.7. There is the upconverted product out here, but we don't really care about that. Another thing to note is that in this case and the previous case of 80 megahertz or 70 megahertz LO, this is what's called low side injection because the LO frequency is less than the RF frequency. It's also possible and frequently done to set the LO to be higher than the RF and that's shown on the right hand side with the LO at 100 megahertz. There's still a difference of 10 and so we get out 10 megahertz from the mixer. And this is what's called high side injection. There are some subtle reasons why you might want to use one versus the other. In the senior design class, we usually ended up using low side injection. If you use high side injection, then you end up at like 110 to 130 megahertz, and that's the aircraft band, and you do not want to be radiating in the aircraft band, so it's just much safer to operate at a low side injection in that case. Because, as we'll see at the end of today's video, there is what's called LO leakage sometimes out of the antenna of a radio. Now many of you may know some of this, especially this part, which is talking about the image problem in these super heterodyne designs. But stick with me because I guarantee you we'll show some interesting things coming up. If you're not familiar with the image problem, here it is in a nutshell. In this particular receiver, we're setting it up to receive something in the range of 915 megahertz. That's an ISM band, 902 to 928 in the United States. And here's the deal. You can set the LO at 904.3, and that will make the difference between 915 and 904.3, 10.7. And it'll go through the filter and then get amplified and demodulated. However, there's also another frequency that if it comes in at the antenna, then it will also output 10.7 megahertz, and it will also get through the filter and possibly interfere with the signal you're trying to listen to if it happens to be equal 
or stronger in power level. So as it says down here at the bottom, second bullet, the undesired response to this 893.6 megahertz signal is called an image response. But here's the thing. You don't necessarily always have a problem because you don't necessarily always have a signal at the image frequency. For a general purpose receiver, yes, you've got to deal with it. So it becomes a problem only if there are signals or noise at that frequency. So to deal with the image problem, we need some solutions or mitigations, partial solutions. One solution, or the classic one, is to add bandpass filters before the mixer. And if you can make these filters narrow enough, then you could block this 893.6 megahertz image if it happened to be on the air. But the problem is it's very difficult, especially at this high frequency, to make these filters narrow enough. Plus, they might have to be tuned as you change the frequency you're trying to pick up. If that's the case, then you probably want to use a higher IF frequency. Let's change the IF frequency from 10.7 to 110 megahertz because we're operating at this higher RF frequency and we have this problem. If we do that, then we have to move the LO down to 805 megahertz and that pushes the image frequency down to 695 megahertz. That makes the design of these filters much easier. A third possible mitigation is to use what's called an image reject mixer. Not going to go into that. Uh, you can Google it, look it up. These tend to offer about 20 to 40 dB of extra rejection, either alone or in conjunction with these filters. They'll improve things by another 20 or 40 dB. What's done a lot of times today is to use what are called zero IF or direct conversion designs that we're going to look at here in a second. And dual conversion architectures. So here is the solution that's used in cell phones. It's called a zero IF architecture or sometimes direct conversion. Because what we do is we take the RF frequency and we mix it with a local oscillator that's set on the same frequency. And what that does is it converts the RF signal down to what's called baseband. In order to make this work in general, you actually need to mix with two different versions of the local oscillator. One using a cosine wave and one using a sine wave, which is 90 degrees separated from the cosine wave. That creates what are called I or in phase and Q or quadrature outputs. And here's what happens. Now, I'm only showing one of these channels because we only have one spectrum analyzer. And so we're just going to look at the I channel output. Over here on the right hand side, we can see the RF and LO feed through. Marker number one is the LO signal at 90 megahertz. And the RF signal itself is also at 90 megahertz, except it's spread plus or minus 2.5 megahertz. That way we can identify it. Now look what happens. When we mix these two together, we get an output that looks like this, the down converted output. It's called a zero IF, but it's not zero because the RF frequency is varying. Now the RF frequency has a bandwidth of about five megahertz, i.e. plus or minus 2.5 around the center. But down here at the baseband, we only see zero to 2.5 megahertz. The other 2.5 is on the other side of zero frequency. And spectrum analyzers usually don't show that. They start at zero and go on up from there. The other thing about spectrum analyzer displays is they're usually only looking at amplitude and not phase. In order to be able to get the phase information as well as amplitude information, that's why you need both the I and the Q output. But for a lot of applications, uh, like the spectrum analyzer itself, you don't necessarily need that phase information. So we're not going to worry about it here. Just remember that using a direct conversion design in order to get all of the information contained in the RF signal, you in general need both an in-phase and quadrature output. Now coming back to this slide, if you freeze it here and look at this and think through it, you'll realize that the zero IF or direct conversion design does not really have an image frequency. It's kind of traded that for the complexity of the negative frequency business. So now let's look at how that is actually used, not in a cell phone, 
but rather in a spectrum analyzer. We're going to take a look at the tiny spectrum analyzer, our tiny SA design. It uses what's called dual conversion architecture. So here is a tiny SA. If you don't have one of these, I highly recommend you get one if you're interested in radio frequency work and don't have a really good spectrum analyzer already. Or maybe even if you do, because these things are like $60. And it goes up to, I think, like 900 megahertz or something. But there's what's called the low band, which goes from 0 hertz to 350 megahertz. And that's what you're seeing here in this photo. And I have the low input, the L rubbed off, hooked up to an antenna. And the signals you're seeing here are some signals in the FM broadcast band because those are usually the strongest ones around. There's nothing else coming in uh, because I'm in an environment where there's not a lot of extra signals and I don't have it hooked up to a big antenna. Now, in order to make a spectrum analyzer be able to sweep from 0 to 350 megahertz, what you're doing is you're making a receiver that works at all these frequencies and has, hopefully, no image responses. In order to make that happen, this spectrum analyzer and most lower frequency spectrum analyzers that aren't in the high gigahertz range use what's called a up-down conversion architecture. This is a screen capture of a video put out by a channel called MSI, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, MSI Guy. And I recommend maybe you take a look at that if you're interested in more details than I'm going to show here. The low input, 0 to 350 megahertz comes in, goes through a low pass filter, and then an, a switchable attenuator and then a mixer. And what that mixer does is it up converts that band from 0 to 350 megahertz up to be centered around somewhere in the 434 megahertz range. And then the spectrum analyzer bandpass filters that and then it uses a direct conversion receiver after that. So that's the down conversion from 434 down to essentially baseband. That's done with some chips called SI4432. And this is the Silicon Labs data sheet. And in this data sheet, you can see the direct conversion receiver design with two mixers uh, using Quadrature LO that come from the top here. What I'm going to do next is take you through this up conversion and down conversion in a bit more detail. Or perhaps in a lot more detail. So here's the diagram that attempts to explain in detail how this spectrum analyzer and most spectrum analyzers that operate in the low gigahertz range work. So let's start by looking at the spectrum analyzer up here in the top left hand corner. This particular one is set up sweeping from 0 hertz to 350 megahertz. And what we see is the FM broadcast band because it's the strongest signals in my area and I don't have much of an antenna hooked to it. So that's all we have other than a noise floor here. Now below this, I have drawn a spectrum plot with frequency on the horizontal axis up through one gigahertz and beyond and amplitude in dBm on the vertical axis, pretty much just like what you see at the top. So this is the spectrum that I'm assuming is out in the environment or that is coming into this connector. The question is, how does this little instrument take what's coming in and show you this beautiful plot of it? And the answer is, it's a radio receiver. Except it's a swept frequency radio receiver. So it tunes from 0 hertz up through 350 megahertz and measures the amplitude of the signals as it goes. And as we've learned, that tuning is done with a mixer, but also with a local oscillator that is swept in frequency in this case. Here, we're sweeping from 434 up to 784 megahertz in order to make this happen. Now, I'm not going to show how the spectrums look at different points in this sweep of the LO. So instead, what I've done is I've frozen the LO at 534 megahertz. That's the frequency that will take something in the FM broadcast band here and basically convert it to 434 megahertz where it will go through this filter. So that's the state that we're in. We've kind of frozen time in the sweep to the point where we we're sweeping from the left to the right, but we're kind of right here in the FM broadcast band. We're passing through the 100 megahertz range. At that point in time, 
This is what the different spectrums in the unit look like. The LO is just a single signal, and it's frozen here in time at 534 megahertz. We know it's sweeping, and that's indicated by the orange arrow here, but at this instant in time where all the other spectrums are shown, it's at 534 megahertz. So that's the LO input at the bottom of the mixer. Let's take a look at the RF input to the mixer. It's essentially what came into the connector, except it's been low-pass filtered to 350 megahertz. So what happens is this spectrum, which represents that there could be signals or noise that's at all frequencies, and then there's a group of strong signals here, as we mentioned, it takes that and filters it so that there's only stuff out to 350 megahertz. Now, notice that there's a kind of reflection of this spectrum from zero, which is where the vertical uh, dBm axis is, out to 350 megahertz. That spectrum is reflected and shows up in the negative frequency region. If you work through the mathematics that explains how this frequency conversion of the mixing works, you have to represent both what are called positive frequencies and negative frequencies. That involves some complex math and Fourier transforms. I'm not going to go into that here. Some of you may know about it. Others maybe not, have not seen it. But just note that there are things called negative frequencies. And it's just a mirror image of what you normally see on the spectrum analyzer, which is only the positive side. Now, when we mix that LO at 534 megahertz with the spectrum shown here that only extends out to 350 megahertz, what happens is the mixer creates some and difference frequencies. In this set of frequencies in the spectrum, there's some stuff around 0 hertz, and that gets converted to 534 megahertz. I'm up here in the upper right now. So there's some signal there, or noise there. And then the stuff at 100 megahertz, the sum of 534 and 100 megahertz, is 634. So where is that? That's about right here. So that's this group of signals. But the difference is 534 minus 100 is 434, and that's this set of signals here. And notice that 434 is the frequency of this bandpass filter. So what's going to happen next is that output spectrum is going to go through this bandpass filter which is going to strip away everything except frequencies within plus or minus 300 kilohertz of 434 megahertz. And that's shown here in this final spectrum. You'll note that there's only two signals showing. That's because 600 kilohertz basically blocked out the third signal that was up in this spectrum, and it did not get through the filter, so only these two did. So we've effectively taken a small sliver of the original spectrum and we've upconverted it to 434 megahertz so we could strip away all but a little bit of signals. Then what we do is we use a direct conversion receiver to convert those down to baseband. And you can see the last spectrum here in the lower right where we've got those signals that were at 434 megahertz and drop them down to baseband. In this direct conversion section, there's also an analog to digital converter, and then it goes to a microprocessor, which is running some code, including digital signal processing. And that digital signal processing can do some further filtering, in particular low-pass filtering, which is easy to do, because we've now constrained the bandwidth down to a few hundred kilohertz. And that can implement what is called the final resolution bandwidth of the spectrum analyzer. Now, if you're watching this and thinking critically, you may be wondering, uh, why did we do all of this upconversion stuff in the first place? Why didn't we just feed the input signal directly into the direct conversion receiver? Well, the reason for that is that the mixer that we've talked about so far, only creating the sum and difference frequencies of the RF and the LO, is not quite true. Real mixers use what are called switching architectures. And in part two, we're going to talk about circuit designs and how those come about. You can't really create a perfect mixer that does the simple conversion that we talked about. But it's close enough that it works, provided you do things like this and strip off 
signals before you do the final down conversion with the direct conversion receiver. Now before we leave this video and uh, move on to part two, which will hopefully come out in a week or two, I wanted to show you how I confirmed that uh, what I showed you in the previous slide is correct. So here is the spectrum analyzer, the tiny SA, with its input connected to the input of another spectrum analyzer that I have. This other spectrum analyzer I've got set up to sweep from 0 hertz up to 1 gigahertz. And you can see an expanded screen down here. Start 0 hertz, stop 1 gigahertz. Because the mixer inside the spectrum analyzer that converts the input spectrum up to 434 megahertz is not perfect, that mixer allows some of the first LO to come out this input port. With that, I was able to actually see some of the feed through from the first LO that's inside this unit. And you can see that in this spectrum. And it goes from, well, let's see, this is 100 megahertz per division. So this is 100, 200, 300, 400. So this is basically your 434. That corresponds to zero frequency. If you're sweeping through frequencies, as we talked about, and you get up to 350, then this is going to be 784 megahertz. And that's what you see here. This is 800, so this is close to 800. As another test, I set the tiny SA to zero span so that it was not sweeping and looked at the signals that were coming out of the port. And you can see those over here on the right-hand side. There's a signal at 533.92 megahertz or 534 megahertz. So all of that validates the claims that I made here about these spectrums and the frequencies that we're sweeping over. So I hope that was useful. I hope you kind of know now kind of what mixers do, but also how real receiving systems work and some of the different architectures, ranging from the superheterodyne through the direct conversion and some conglomerates of those two. In part two of episode five, we're going to go into a little bit of math review. We're also going to look at circuit designs of different mixers. And finally, we'll get back to the FM receiver that our project is centered around in the course. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this. I know it was a little thick, so ask questions or go back and look through stuff and freeze some screens and think about it. There is a lot of material here. I tried to pack this full. Hopefully I did not pack it too full. Hope to see you in part two.